Slava Jesus Christ. Lord of Jesus Christ. Father Lawrence, thank you so much for refreshing my memory about the history of this diocese. God protected, God saved. Especially, you reminded me the history of the church newspaper and how the schismatic priest had put things in his name and then turned against Bishop Orestes. Father Mark Leisure, don't even try it. <laughs> Welcome to everyone. First, a few thank yous. Uh, Nick Mahaley, where are you? Oh, I know where he is. Did you hear him blank? Did I say sit down? You have to be obedient to the bishop, you know. Did you hear him playing the violin? He is actually a member of the Johnstown Symphony that I went to the other night. I said, you know, I've been in Atlanta, big symphony. I've been in Charlotte, big symphony. Many European cities, big symphonies. All of them excellent. Johnstown? <laughs> is there a symphony here? Let me tell you something. The Johnstown Symphony is one of the best I have ever heard. If you could have heard the national anthem that they played to start the concert, you would say, this is what we need to hear everywhere the national anthem is played. Not ad-libbed by some singer, that does their own rendition off key. Just this beautiful sound that they created. Thank you, Nicholas. You can sit now. <laughs> of course, when you put anything together like this, a diocesan uh, council so bored, or any kind of event, you know, if you've put something on in your own community, there's always people working behind the scenes. And so there was a committee, if you will, about this Sobor. Uh, Father Miles, where are you? You can stand for just a moment. <laughs> Father Miles was responsible to figure out, along with his crew, whether you were going to eat a cow tonight or a fish. <laughs> Is that correct? Correct. We thank you for your efforts. <laughs> Is Romain here? Stand up, Romain. The lady with the sort of, sort of flowery dress was in charge of these kind of flowery things. She decorated the cathedral for us, and she was involved in several things like the display of the hierarchs' vestments. I hope you had a chance to look at those. One from the three hierarchs prior to me, the ruling hierarchs, of course. And you should see, you know, how beautiful those are. We thank you for your efforts. You can sit down. <laughs> of course, she was not by herself. Where is Susan? Susan also was involved in many ways, including the display of the hierarchical vestments. And so we thank you, Susan, not only for your efforts, but for allowing us to borrow your husband also. <laughs> you can sit down. Where is Nick? Uh, 
not with his wife. See? We're marrying him. Let me just tell you a little bit about Nick. Before I even got to Johnstown as the bishop, Father Frank said, there's this guy who is going to call you. His name is Nick Walker. He's the IT guy. He's the guy who's going to com connect you to the computers and things like this, tell him what you need. I can tell you, I have some of the best computing equipment, and I can connect to the outside world. And so for that, I thank you publicly, not only in the office, but in the residence. I have access to the outside world, and of course, all the emails that you send me every day. <laughs> Thank you. You have found my email address, Bishop Gregory of Nisa at gmail.com. Please do not send it to Bishop Gregory at gmail.com. That's a Catholic guy. <laughs> Nick also serves as our photo presbyter, if you will. <laughs> And so, thank you, Nick, for all the photography. The seminarian stood earlier, but because they're your future priests, stand up one more time. In, in addition to their studies, which they have been faithfully been taking care of here for the last month and some uh, days. They've also been helping Father Frank and the staff to get things ready for your arrival and you saw them even working today. Uh, yesterday, of course, they passed out stewardship materials, the mouse book, and a few other things. Today they passed out the medallions. They are the gophers, if you will, of our diocese here in Johnstown. In less than an hour and 20 minutes, they unpacked all my stuff out of three shipping containers into my house before the rain and snow came back in February. And so I thank you for that and thank you for the commitment you have for the future of our church. And so look at them. These are the next guys. Coming out quickly, some of them, at May, three of them. They're coming. They're good. They're going to need your support to be the best they can be. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, if you're a delegate, Clergy lady, could you please stand for just a minute? Stand. You can do this, it's easy. Stand. You want me to say it in Greek? Sikuthite. We thank you for coming, taking time out of your busy schedules to be here in Johnstown with your brother priests and other delegates from different communities, to be with your bishop so that he can see you in your eyes, you can see him in his eyes and we could discuss things about our past, our present, and our future. And so again, I thank you for coming. If I've been to your community, I will come again, but only after I visit the other communities, of which there are still about 60, no, 50. I'm coming. In the next year and a half, I'll be there. And if we don't have a really harsh winter, you will see me some Sunday morning unexpectedly. <laughs> you guys can sit now. I would suggest you go ahead and bake the bread, put the salt in it, and put it in the freezer. When you see the car that has a Louisiana license plate on it and the North Carolina seal on the side, Put it in the microwave. <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest person in the room is 99 years old. Is that correct? But he left. Oh, Mr. George. 
Mr. George. We thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Mr. George is a special man. You guys know him a lot longer than I do. But it's really interesting. I saw him somewhere. And he mentioned to me that he had some little tables that he wanted to give me. A little table. Yay, hi. This big around. And I said, well, I need two of those, jokingly. Within a week, I had two of them. I mean, he stayed up and made some beautiful tables at 99. One of them is in the bishop's residence, and one of them is at Camp Nazareth in my little room there, where I can place my cup of tea and my reading materials when I'm there. And so, again, I thank you, Mr. George, for everything. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Father Lawrence, I thank you for your historical stuff. You pull some details out of history that I wish more of us knew about and study the way you have studied history. Uh, Father Jonathan, you did such a beautiful job with your presentation and toasting us as the master, as they say, and your singing of Bob Hope. I'm not sure how many of our kids know who Bob Hope is, but I don't know who he is. And so uh, everyone else in this room does too. And so I thank you for all of that. A week ago, a week ago or two weeks ago, you were in the paper. Two weeks ago on Saturday, 10 days ago then, so it'd be two weeks this Saturday. Come on, Father, help me here. <laughs> two weeks this Saturday. Father Maloro was on the back page of the Johnstown newspaper. It's a place reserved every week for those special people who have done something really special or something special that's happening in their lives or they have like this extraordinary arrest record or... <laughs> Because you've been living it for a year, that's why. This is like a worse. <laughs> In any case, there's this article about Father Frank. The local paper came, the editor, he did the article right up. Father Frank has always had the church, the cathedral, and its events in the newspaper. You know, they had a very good relationship with us. And so they do this beautiful story about Father Frank and mention the fact that he is retiring, but he's staying on as chancellor. I mean, it was part of the headlines. And in the article, the editor decided to write a quote, as I was just talking to him, you know, off the cuff, if I will, that he is like Benjamin Franklin. He is the elder statesman of our diocese. What that means is he knows so many things about so many th priests, so many communities, the history, the relationships between all this stuff, that he is an integral part of our diocese and the right hand man of the bishop. I'm sure with Metropolitan Nicholas, you were his right hand man. In the year I've been with you, you are the right hand man. And so that's why he cannot retire completely. He will not be the dean any longer after Sunday's liturgy. 
but he will still be the chancellor for the foreseeable future. That's a very vague term. <laughs> You should be. <laughs> but to lose your chancellor would be like cutting off limbs. Your right arm would be gone. I, left, I lost my left with Michael. I'll let you know when you're leaving. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. <laughs> in the office, if you've ever been the chancellery, we're going down the long hallway in these hierarchs on the walls, patriarchs, all this kind of business. You get down to the right side, it's Father Frank's office, you get to the left side, it's my office. There's a big wooden, wooden cross right in the middle, and you can go either right or left, like a fork in the road, but around the back, there's a little hallway that connects us, so it's like a circle. I can't tell you how many days we've left the doors open in the back, but closed the front, as we share things of our diocese. Good things, positive things, sometimes negative things, tragic things, but we're able to communicate through that little hallway there, I can't tell you how many times we have laughed. I mean a lot. Either he thinks I'm funny, <laughs> and I am, <laughs> or I think he's funny, and he is. This gentleman can put on such a straight face, but has a streak of humor in him, that sometimes we're almost rolling on the floor. <laughs> and so, until the laughter stops, we have to work together. I pledge. I'm sure you do. <laughs> now, I've talked about the Chancellor, I've talked about the relationship he has with the bishop in the office. I'll tell you what, if the staff is not there, we're dead in reality. If Pawnee Connie doesn't show up when she's supposed to be there, and Pawnee Betty doesn't show up when she's supposed to be there, and Claire doesn't show up with her dog Turner <laughs> when she's supposed to be there, we are in trouble. When I said yesterday that they are like Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph and Salome, I meant it. They are what hold it together. They're doing things that I don't even know they're doing. But all of a sudden the report shows up. Or this has been prepared. Or they have handled this phone call for me. It's amazing, these three women, what they have done. And I thank them for that. And so you need to stand up. of being the last one to speak is you've got to listen to everybody else say something and you go, God, I was going to say that. <laughs> and then the next one comes, oh, God, I'm going to say that now. And so if you heard anything that you've heard before, know that I already had this written out. When you were eating your salad, I was writing stuff down. <laughs> this book, 
that you're going to take home, I hope, and put somewhere where your family members will have access to it, this commemorative album. <coughs> I received a copy several days ago when they came into Johnstown, and I took it home and I read every word of it. Go to the first page. There's an icon there of some city, which of course is Johnstown. And what do you see there? The Conamal River is running through. There's a steel mill there. There's a railroad track that carries the train that I hear at least 20 times a day. I mean, really, the trains are moving constantly. There are two little openings of mines there. There is a row, a row of houses, row houses as they're called. There's a church there. Behind it, there's a little mountain. That mountain is what I look at every day out of my office. Reminds me of the mountain in my dad's village. Almost identical. Now, how'd that happen? Don't know. But I can look out at that mountain and I can know what the day is going to be like. If the trees are bare, it's still winter. If they start to pop green, spring is coming. If they're fully green, it's summer. If it's foggy and I can't see the mountain, my flight at 6.20 in the morning from the airport is going to be delayed. <laughs> now, it's fully engaged in the fall colors. Soon the leaves will start to fall. It'll get cold looking out there. And inevitably the snows will come. That's my little mountain there, just so you know. And of course, the Theotokos is there. The Platitera, if you will, with the Christ child. Looking over this city of Johnstown which I have told several hierarchs of other jurisdictions is the Mecca of orthodoxy in America. If you don't believe me, ask them. But ask me first who they were so you don't look foolish asking someone who never heard that. If you turn the page, you will find letters from the Patriarch, from Archbishop Dimitrios, from your current hierarch here, from our beloved Chancellor, and then you come to a page where we are remembering those that we have lost in the last couple of years. You see them, their memory is eternal, in the clouds, and on the right side, of course, is our beloved Metropolitan Nicholas, sitting in a stasidi. That's the Greek word for that type of chair. It's the chair that sits along the walls of churches and monasteries that you really can't get a full seat in. There's a little shelf there that gives you just enough place to rest and it even pops up so you can actually stand in it. Stasidi means to stand. And this is a beautiful picture of the Metropolitan with all of his pertinent dates there. And then if you continue, there's a chronology of important dates starting from 863 all the way down to today. You need to read this if you have not. I'm about to do it right now. Pay attention to me right now. <laughs> but when you go home, sit down and read this timeline of orthodoxy and how it's related to this diocese. I mean, everything is there. I mean, really and truly. Then, if you go a little further past the timeline, you'll find an essay by Father Lawrence on the spiritual history of our diocese. There are some photographs there with some of the institutions you are familiar with, I hope. The church there, the cathedral, the chancellery, the bishop's residence, 
the seminary, the Hellenic Center across Hellenic. Wow, can I say that? Oh, Lord. It looks like the Hellenic Center that I grew up in. But the center there that we had our meeting, our meals in, and of course, down in the lower left is our chapel at Camp Nazareth. It's a beautiful essay. Please take the time to read every word. It's a long essay, if you will, but very important to who you are. And then he even writes a little history about the Prostopinia, which I found extremely entertaining. Entertaining in that it was educational for me to see this business about music and how it has evolved and what it has turned into. And I told you earlier in my address at the beginning that I learned the eight tones of the Byzantine chant, and now I'm having to learn eight new tones with this particular chanting style. And it's not so easy, but I am doing the best I can on that. And then if you really want to be entertained after you've read all this educational stuff, the timeline in these two essays, you come to the minutes of the Congress in 1937. I mean, I was reading this thing and going, wow. Look at how passionate these people were in how they spoke about what was happening to them how they spoke to each other in a friendly way, how they spoke to each other in a very angry way. And I don't know all the words, Father, that you learned when you went to Connecticut <laughs> from that chanter, but I think a few of them have slipped into the minutes. <laughs> First day, firestorm. Second day, a little easier. Third day, they're holding hands. After they almost beat each other up. Read this. This is beautiful history of where this diocese came from. I, I mean, I really love the centerfold. Look at the centerfold. This picture with all these people gathered in Pittsburgh in 37. And of course, you can pick out some of these people. I was picking out people. And I don't even know these people. But I could pick out Orestes and a few others of the leadership just from my previous readings and seeing the photographs. And yet, look at the faces of these people. I could change the bottom down there, and it would say Greek Orthodox Congress of 19 whatever. The same men, the same faces, the same seriousness of what they were doing. This is the stuff we're celebrating now, the origins of this 75-year-old diocese. I want you to read this. I want you to see that from Campbell, Ohio, Paul Titus was there. I have no idea who Paul Titus is, but I wanted to read his name. And that there are other parishes where Father John Miller from Central City was there, along with his delegates. I mean, these are your people. Your family members are here a couple of generations back. And so please take the time to look at this and share this with your kids when you go home. Your kids, your grandkids, your godchildren, don't let them forget who they are. They go, oh man, that's like 10 pages. I can't possibly read all that. Sure you can. You could spend two hours playing a video game. You could read this in less than an hour. But learn. Share it. Don't let them off the hook. And then if you continue, you come to the September 19th, 1938 letter from Benjamin, who was the patriarch of Constantinople at that time, essentially telling you that your bishop had been elected. And then the next page, 
the letter of the ordination, where the three hierarchs who were responsible for his ordination, his consecration, if you will, the laying on of hands, attest to, yes, we have elevated this man to be a bishop. That's your history. That's kind of like your Declaration of Independence kind of quality document. You should have this very close by, and then everybody who ever went to theology school had to learn about the seven ecumenical councils. We talk about it all the time. Here is a summary of what they did. And they met for weeks and months at a time. And it wasn't always nice. Can a seminarian tell me what happened with the bishop named Nicholas and the bishop named Arius? Stand to Joseph and tell us what happened to these beautiful bishops of the Orthodox Church. He slugged him to the floor. There's an icon of that. Arius was eventually declared a heretic and thrown out. If you want to know more about him, Google it. He had an interesting end to his life. I won't tell you what it is. <laughs> no, I'm not. They just finished eating. <laughs> and then we finish up by looking at the dates of the sobors of this diocese and the cities that were hosting. And your cities, some of them are there that were hosting or co-hosting, as you will. And then, of course, the diamond, the gold, and the silver contributor sponsors. And you will see your name there. And then on the last page itself is a beautiful altar of the cathedral where we cannot forget yesterday we celebrated a beautiful liturgy and with a choir that was truly unbelievable and amazing. And so I thank the brother priest for leading all of us in a beautiful service, especially Father David and Father Peter, who were, if you can say, the protopsaltis, the first chanters that led all the rest of us. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And then we took uh, uh, a man named William George and ordained him to the diaconate at this same altar. And so I'm sure it was a big day for him. If you're a clergyman, you remember what your day of ordination was like at the diaconate level, and of course at the priesthood. You're in a different zone. You, you're not with the rest of us. Something is going on with you. A good thing. And then eventually you come down to earth. But it is a high that is undescribable, and only those who have experienced it can really know what I'm talking about. And then, of course, the cover. The cathedral, okay, with all the hierarchs that have served here. I have to tell you that Bishop John and I have a special relationship. When I walk in the front door of the chancellery, especially at night, and I walk by and he's on the left side, I always say, good night, Yeronda. Good night, Yeronda. Yeronda is like the wise man. And then I walk in, of course, and I get through the little foyer, and there are names there of priests and others who have died of our diocese, and then I walk in, and the first photo is the photo of Metropolitan Nicholas that sat on the throne for a year and a half. You know the one I'm talking about. Okay? That was taken from the day of my ordination as we commemorated him and placed in the office. And many times I say to him, good morning, Yeronda, as I come through the house and go toward my office. And of course, the others a little further down, Martin and Orestes, their photos. So I am connected to these gentlemen that you knew in the flesh, and I only know from pictures and from reading about them. But look how Bishop Nicholas is located. He's looking over my shoulder. Here. 
That's a good feeling for me. I know I'm not alone in that building. Even at night, I'm not alone. Of course, Christ is with me. That's what we believe. You're never alone. Your garden angel is with you. But the memory of these men is with me. And I honor them. I, connect, I feel connection to them. I can't explain that either, other than just tell you there's a, some kind of connection. But I'm on a first name basis with them. Now, this beautiful crown that we have talked about with uh, Metropolitan Orestes, you'll see a photo of him with that in some places. I tried to put that thing on before my ordination. Lord, that thing was heavy. I mean, really heavy. Like 25, 30 pounds heavy. I mean, it's like, woo. The only thing that saved me is it doesn't fit on my head. So we went right back into the little display case. And as I have told some people, I think there were probably about 15 crowns in the little vesting area of the house, the storage area. And of those 15 crowns, thank God, two of them fit my head. And so I didn't have to buy immediately a crown. And so the crown you saw the other day is Metropolitan Nicholas's crown. Those vestments that you saw were the first time I had worn them fully my vestments. Except for the crown. Prior to that, I've been wearing Metropolitan Nicholas's things. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, the only piece I had to worry about was the sticarion, the underneath robe, because I'm taller than Metropolitan Nicholas. If I had worn his, it would look sort of like a, not a mini, but a maxi, <laughs> this far off the floor. But the sacos, the homophoria, the cuffs, the petrachilion, those are his. And I have worn them for a year now as I've traveled around. And during Lent, I found the purple set. And I had my own purple set, but I needed a purple sacos. Found one. And for Pentecost, the green. Found it. And so it's a tradition to pass along the vestments of a bishop to the next bishop. Two crowns fit my head. Thirteen crowns do not fit my head. Next time you pick a bishop, measure his head. <laughs> know that I love you. Pray for me like I pray for you. Thank you again for coming. Tomorrow we have a few things to take care of, but for the most part, our major business is finished. And so let's enjoy the rest of the evening. And then tomorrow morning, start with prayers and then finish our business and then travel safely as you go home, uh, wherever you're going, whether it's to the north, like Father Maxime is going back to Ottawa eventually, or to the south, like Father Nicholas going all the way into the Sunshine State. Father Sam is going out to Chicago area. And the rest of you are heading either east or close by here or a little bit west. But be safe as you travel. You don't have to get there in record time. Just get there. Okay? Liturgy is on Sunday. You got plenty of time to get home. I have enjoyed myself these two days. In a major way have I enjoyed myself. People have asked me, well, how do you feel? I feel great. I feel like I'm soaring like an eagle. But I am soaring with a whole flock of eagles. What a group of people we have who love their church. There isn't one person in the room that doesn't love their church. Nobody.
who hates their church would be here. You love the church. And since we all love the church, we will work for the church. We will work for Jesus Christ as part of his army and take on the world. And whatever the challenges are, we can overcome them. What do we have to fear? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Somebody said that a long time ago. I know who said it, all you Democrats. <laughs> FDR, I know who said it. I love reading history, I remember. Okay? We can do this. Whatever we want, we can do. If we put our minds to it, we work hard with our blood, sweat, and tears. That's a group, I think, from the 70s. Blood, sweat, and tears. We can achieve anything. All of it will be for naught if we don't make it to paradise. That's our number one goal. Everything else is a secondary goal. And so we have to work clergy and laity to make it to paradise. To go to Garden of Eden, to be with our God, to walk with Christ, to be with his mother, to be with the saints of the church, to be with all the good angels where there's light and warmth. No pain, sorrow, or suffering. Or, let's not work for that. Let's end up in hell, where there is no God. There is no Panagia. There is no Christ. There are no saints. There are some bad angels, we call them demons. And the guy who has made life miserable for humanity from the beginning is there waiting for us. Let him wait. We choose not to go there. And so work really hard so we have a good chance to be with God in Christ. Because in hell there's nothing but pain, nothing but tears, nothing but sorrow, nothing but sickness and death hunger and cold and darkness that is not where we want to be okay so do we have an agreement to work to make it to paradise together just shake your head like this I will not ask something different like you don't want to be in heaven we want to heaven we just need to work hard to get there okay that's all I got to say. Thank you so much.